Welcome to Wine Decoded. We've got a wonderful winemaker session uh, and we've got today with us Pietro Adero. Thank you very much for coming. My and, pleasure. Thank you for and having me. Madeline's back with us today. Maddie's back with us to shoot the breeze and talk all things uh, Italian wine, particularly wine from Bar Barolo and Piedmont. We've got some stuff from uh, further east as well. So thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, long way to come, so we appreciate you coming down. It's a pleasure, you know, after two years of COVID lockdown and this and that, it's such a pleasure to do not any more virtual tastings, but yeah. live tastings. We get to drink together here. again. Here, exactly. <laughs> and actually, I got to tell you that some of the wines we are tasting today are, are completely finished in Italy and yeah. in Europe. Yeah. So it, it worth the flight uh, to come here and yeah. taste some bottles that are completely, you know, uh, sold fantastic. out at home. It's easier to find them here. So yep. it's always nice to, to do seven, 27 hour flights for some Nebbiolo. No? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'd do it. Uh, so we, we have around 300 Nebbiolos on our list. Oh, wow. And we get so many inquiries from overseas uh, about some of the gear that we've got. So we're very lucky in Australia now to have access to your wines and, and uh, so many other beautiful Barolos. And I can girls. tell you, it's not that. Yeah, the Barolo producers are hackers and sending you fake requests. Uh, it's yeah, all yeah, real. Yeah, yeah. It's all real. We are uh, not like pushing yeah, yeah. the market uh, yeah. with fake accounts. <laughs> it's all real. I don't want to ask for the money first. Before I <laughs> so it's, it's okay. Um, but hey, listen, we'd, we'd love to, to learn a little bit more about Odero. And reading, reading about Odero, it's uh, Poderio Odero, it's, it's got an amazing history. It goes back centuries and centuries. And the more I explored Odero, the more I realised how uh, intertwined within the development of Barolo in general Odero has been, uh, and and your your grandfather and his predecessors and so on. But so so tell us tell us a little bit about Odero's history and um, how how it came to being where it is today. So let's say let's start uh, saying that um, I I feel very lucky and honored because I have the opportunity to be on the other side of the world talking about uh, our wines, the fruit of our land. And this makes me really proud because you have to think that um, 60, 70 years ago, our uh, area, our region was very different. It was very different straight after World War II. We had a one year and a half of civil war. So Piedmont and especially the Lang area uh, were very poor devastated by the war uh, and so things have changed a lot why i'm saying this because it's true our roots they go very very deeply into the piemontese uh, terroir in the, into the lange area my family started making wine uh, more than 300 years ago in la morna mm. i'm the seventh generation of the odero family involved in the winemaking processes and someone says also the best generation <laughs> <laughs> every generation keeps saying it yeah. that's why we improve you know uh, we gotta wait until you're dead before we make those calls you know so <laughs> and um and so uh, yes my my grandfather really helped a lot the winery to grow, but not only the, the, the region in general, together with other important and great wine producers, they really did so many efforts and uh, it's thanks to their efforts that uh, we are now able to have the possibility to have such a strong denomination, such strong mm -hmm. products, because they had the idea and the vision that working together was the best to reach mm -hmm mutual goals yes. mm. and uh, it's something that very often Italy is missing mm. because Italy you know is such a small country but it's uh, it's a country of different <laughs> uh, uh, cultures different come on uh, you've got amazing politics and it's so oh, yeah. it's, it's yeah, yeah, such it's, great continuity it never changes yeah no no it's true <laughs> it's like a, a reality show it's <laughs> like a, it's a real reality show but paid by, by but paid by the taxpayers so, so yeah, it's yeah. amazing uh, and so you know it's difficult on one hand it's amazing because you have so many differences so many different cultures every place is different mm. on the other hand socially, politically speaking, it, it's difficult to handle everything. But they yeah. really had the idea uh, to, to, to work together for a specific uh, goal and uh, they reached it. So, uh, again, as I said, I'm the seventh generation and uh, I can say that uh, the winery really uh, exploded 
uh, exploded actually is not the correct verb uh, during mm. this time of the year, especially in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so really, uh, we had uh, like a great, uh, uh, great, great result with my grandfather's generation, and then after with yeah. uh, um, my mom, who's the one that's running yeah. the the winery. He, my grandfather, helped a lot the region with the denominations, with the institutions, uh, uh, writing the the, the the laws that actually are running the Barolo and the Barbaresco area and you know just I think that uh, everyone can express every winery can express itself just when there's like uh, an environment that permits you to be clear correct and mm. very very you, you and very you, you start always from the, all the wineries they are at the same level and then you can express yourself but you need yeah. strong determinations yeah it's interesting because you were talking about your experience working in australia mm -hmm. and how things differ with things that you can can do and can't do and sometimes having things like a doc uh, allows you to raise the the base level quality for everyone but sometimes do you find it constraining? It sort of stops you maybe doing a few things that you'd like to try. It's, it's, a, it's a very good question. It's true. More laws, more regulation means that you have less rights. Let's call it like this. Yeah. Hmm. But in some ways, I think that in specific district like ours, culture, tradition is not a trend so needs to be respected. Mm. So it's correct to have quite strict regulations. Then, of course, you can do your style. I can do the vinification I want, the aging time. But it's correct to have a very strict regulations because those regulations are not, were not decided by like uh, three guys a morning having a coffee. It's like mm. centuries of history and experience. So yeah. it is, to me, I'm usually... Italy is the land of bureaucracy, paperwork, and we have plenty of it. But in some ways, uh, the, 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 the very strict laws we have with Barolo and Barbaresco, I'm, I'm, I'm happy about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. interesting. But... How do you like to try and balance tradition with potentially more experimentation? Do you try to bring that into your winemaking or into the vineyards? It's, um, it's, it's uh, difficult on one hand when your winery is more than 300 years old uh, <laughs> because, uh, because you know you have lots of history, lots of uh, generations before they knew that already uh, reached great results. So you need to be humble and respectful. What I like to say is that my mom and my cousin Isabella who are the two big bosses because unfortunately, actually I'm, I'm talking with you, unfortunately our winery is only run by women. Mm. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> uh, unfortunately for me, that's why I'm in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> You've been kicked out of the country. <laughs> exactly, yeah. of, of the continent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, my mom and my cousin Isabella, they started what I like to call a silent revolution. Okay. Mm. A silent revolution, what does it mean? That uh, the final result it's, uh, I wouldn't say the same, but uh, it's, uh, you know, traditional and classic. Mm -hmm. But a silent revolution means that uh, it's, it's, it's more difficult, you know, it's more difficult to do this kind of revolution because it takes more time. And if they are silent, you cannot advertise them because yeah. they are silent. And so um, they started this, which means to me atte more attention to each single step of the vinification, each single process, just when you know everything, you are able to don't do anything. Hmm. So each single step, more attention. Also because, let's be honest, our region now in the last, not, not, not recently, but in the last decades, economically speaking, improved a lot. Hmm. So we have the possibilities to be focused and not, not the possibility. It should be mandatory to be more focused and because we all have the possibility with techniques and you know people uh, workers back in the days it was not like this back in mm. the days people were doing the submerged the cap for example yeah. you know to to mm -hmm. have the cap submerged yeah. it was it is tradition but it was mainly because there weren't enough people in the in the cellar during the vinification yeah. so you submerge yeah. the cap you leave it there like a month and then you can do some other stuff mm -hmm. so i mean sometimes tradition is also because you need to reach some results but you don't have enough people to do yeah. it it's pragmatic Exactly, yeah. pragmatic. So, what what I think it's very important right now is to 
say, to ask to yourself, why are we doing this? It's tradition, yes, but why are we doing it? And so be focused in each step and mm. trying to understand carefully every single little inch mm. of, of, the, of your, of your yeah. trip. Yeah. So I, I think a lot of that uh, comes, comes back to understanding the science, understanding how things change and evolve, and then adding, when you understand that, you can add your own yeah, touch, yeah. Yeah, the, the artist, artistic side of it to the process. Um, it's only then, you know, when you really have that deep understanding that you can throw the rule book away. Um, and, yeah, I completely agree. And it's true. One of the, the biggest challenges with wine, though, is you've only got one shot a year. We, how many coffees do we drink? And how many times? Too does, many. Yeah, yeah, well, too many. <laughs> too many. But, but you, you know, you can roast coffee uh, four or five times a day, every day of the year, and experiment. But only, only once, right. a, once a year with wine. One so, shot. Yeah. The agriculture businesses are like this. One shot. And another important thing is to say that you have one shot, you wait 12 months, but maybe in 15 minutes with a huge hailstorm, you lose everything. Yeah. Because that's what yeah. happens. Huh? Yeah. People sometimes do not understand it, but some, in some specific time of the year, like with hail or frost, in 15 minutes, not even 16, you can lose one year's 70% yeah. of, your, of your crop. Yeah, that's mm. scary. That's, that's yeah. scary. And it's not just one year's work, it's the, it's the next year gets affected yeah. and potentially the year after that. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So when, when, when you were growing up, was Barolo wealthy when you were growing up? Maybe when you were a little boy? And... Yeah, yeah. Even if uh, I look such a very grown man because this beard, I have to say, it's real and it's not fake. <laughs> <laughs> no, when I, when I... At least you can grow one. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, I'm still waiting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, our, I, 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 again, as I said before, my generation got really lucky because when I started working, when I started, you know, uh, being uh, uh, involved in the wine world, uh, uh, the, the area reached already um, yeah. reached success, the, the, the yeah. peak of uh, of the of the pyramid, you know. Yeah. So yeah. it, uh, I've never experienced uh, the, the the other side, you know, when when it was more difficult to sell Barolo and much easier to sell Dolcetto and Barbera. It's yeah. something that happened years, years, decades ago. Uh, so for my for my cousin Isabella and for myself. Uh, it was it was easier, yeah. and I recognize mm. it. That's why we need, especially us, this my generation. We need to stay very humble. Mm. We are not saving anyone's life. Mm. We need to be respectful, mm. and it, it's a, it's already a result just to carry on, mm. and to no. Of course, the the the, the goal is to improve always, yeah. and 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 it's that, that that's mandatory, but. Uh, without losing our roots and without losing our culture because it's mm -hmm. it's easy for us now being here in australia talking about barolo my grandfather uh, for him was difficult to go to 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 to, to paris yeah so yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely okay um, i was gonna ask did you always want to be involved in the family wine business or is it something that you took a bit of time to, to come around to? No, it's, um, uh, I mean, it was my choice. Yeah. It was my choice. Uh, we, in my family, there's, uh, there are family members who are not involved in the, in the, in the family business. <coughs> and when this happens, we just simply kill them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they make incredibly good fertilizer. <laughs> yes. It's a compost. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the yeah. secret. And the, and the color retention. Uh, so, for example, my cousin, Giacomo, he's a medical doctor. He's not involved uh, in the winery. And so, because you know, you have to know that in my family we don't have fantasy. We are all winemakers or doctors. We help mm -hmm. people in different ways. Mm -hmm. We heal their soul, they heal their body. <laughs> uh, and, um, and the funny thing is that my dad is a nephrologist, so we send him lots of yep. patients with their kidneys fucked. And, and you need someone to look after livers as well. <laughs> huh? Exactly, yeah. we, are, we are looking for one. <laughs> uh, so, no, it was my choice. I've studied economics at the university. I, Actually, I, I have to tell you this. In my family, uh, my mom, uh, um, my cousin Isabella too, and my, my mom, she's a winemaker and an agronomist, so she studied that. But my cousin and me were encouraged to um, open our minds with something different yes. and then start working at the winery. Okay. So not always wine, 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 wine. We are lucky because we have the opportunity to, to learn how to make wine at home. 
Mm. So I said at the beginning, let's study and do something that I like. And then I got into wine, doing yeah. experiences abroad in Australia, in France, in Italy, mm -hmm. and I'm still learning. Yeah, ah, well, if you stop learning, then you give it away. There's, there's no point. Yeah. But it's interesting that you talk about uh, your mum being an agronomist because your family has been involved in a, a lot more than just wine. Um, we were talking about truffles earlier, yeah. talking about the laws around the, the beautiful hazelnuts, hazelnuts, and, uh, yeah. you know, beautiful honey. There's so many products in the Langang yeah. uh, that are made by wonderful farmers. Yes. Uh, and, uh, so and we don't have to lose this um, biodiversity. Uh, so the the idea of having to gather uh, different crops is it's important. Our land is beautiful. It's it's amazing. It looks like a vineyard, a huge vineyard garden. Mm. But we don't have to lose the biodiversity uh, with hazelnuts, uh, uh, with you know uh, the different uh, truffle trees, oak trees, uh, many other trees, uh, uh, tiglio that I don't know how to call in Italian or. Uh, to call in English, sorry, um, or you know the mulberry trees, which are mm, typical yeah. from La Morra. So we don't have to lose that. My mom, who's a, also an agronomist, she's really <clears throat> into that, yeah. and so uh, she has her orchard. It's her, you know, peaceful place, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and uh, she planted many ancient varieties of peaches, of uh, apples, of cherries, of uh, many different fruit, uh, and of course, I'm the sweet guy of the family. I started making honey, yeah, uh, and uh, and so there's a combination. There's a combination yeah. that I mean, it's not a, it's not. I mean, I know right now there's lots of greenwashing and that I hate personally. Personally. But we almost do not advertise this. Uh, I'm saying it because you know we were in, into this discussion. But I almost do not advertise it because we are really doing it because we like it. Yes. It's, it's not a marketing yeah. strategy. We yeah. like it. We have this. We believe in that. We have these, and you know, even if I do not produce a single uh, kilo of honey, I'm just happy seeing the bees around. Oh. Yeah, uh, and the, yeah, bees are fantastic. Uh, we've got uh, beehives in the family as well. Um, it's interesting, when I was working at Yarra Yearing, it was very much the same. We had a, a, a citrus grove and, mm. you know, we had orchards and so many, so many things planted uh, and it, it fed everyone yeah. uh, that worked there. Uh, so we'd, we'd spend a, a lot of time working with the, the fruits and the vegetables and all of those kind of things as well. Uh, and that's, I think it's the nature of people that love wine and yeah. are sort of at the top of their game. They, they, they obviously love food as well exactly. and, and, yeah. and, and want, to, want to drive in that direction. Uh, yeah, that's true. Is this, uh, this yeah, and obviously you do it because you love it, but is it something you try to bring into the vineyard or does it just happen very naturally because you have such inherent biodiversity in your region? Um, no, the, in, the, in the last years, uh, the, the, this philosophy in general, it's definitely more and more popular. Okay. What I can tell you, a big, a big change my mom um, started in 2008 yes. was to convert all the vineyards to the organic method. Mm -hmm. So the farming, it's uh, organic, it's not easy in Piedmont and especially at, at an estate like ours, 36 hectares scattered in nine different villages. Yeah. So small little fragmented uh, parcels and you know to be organic in Piedmont with not just a single big plot but like this. It's, yeah. It can be difficult and... Uh, You've got to wonder whether your neighbours are being organic yeah, yeah. and deal with those kind of things. Exactly, and uh, when it rains to, to, to do the, the, the organic treatments all over the place and not just in a single place, it's, it's a lot of work. But uh, it's, again, it's something that we do because we, we really believe into that and it's, it's, it's important. Yeah. It's expo we are living out of the terroir, out of the soil, out of the, of the environment in, we are, in, in yeah. which we are. We cannot just, you know, pretend to. Yeah. It's, it's got to get back. Exactly, yes. exactly. So tell me, there's been a lot changing in, and there's always things changing in the climate, uh, mm -hmm. uh, ideas and philosophies in, in uh, viticulture. You've had to deal with lots of things. There's been more extreme hail events. Uh, and I think all, 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 not hail events, weather events all around the world, whether it be hail or frost or heat waves. What's been happening in the vineyards at the moment for, for you? Where, how are you managing to deal with these, these kind of things? 
Uh, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, it's um, you know the, the the weather can. What 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 scares me the most in our region? It's not the fact that uh, the weather is much warmer than in the past. If you look at the average temperature, is more or less the same. But things are getting more extreme. Mm -hmm. When it's hot, it's really hot. When it's dry, it's really dry. When it's wet, mm. it's really wet. So there are peaks, you know, up yeah. and downs, and that that's difficult to manage. If you look at the the average, at the end is more or less the same. But it's not like this. It's like this. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Roller coaster ride, huh? <laughs> like bitcoins, up and yeah. down, up down, up down, up down. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so it's uh, it's it's not easy to to to, to handle it. First of all, I want to say this, and um, I personally think that something in the weather has changed all over the world. It's not just my personal idea. It's you know, hmm. uh, but I do completely not agree with some people who are saying now the north exposed vineyards are better than the south exposed ones. Mm. To mm. me, that's completely not true. Mm. The good vineyards were good, will be good, are good, okay. and the best mm. expo exposures are the, the that ones. It doesn't mean that uh, if it's uh, south, ex south for us, north for you, I mean, they, mm. they did the opposite, no? Mm. <clears throat> So the good exposures were good because you don't have to think just about the um, the sugar contents, but the phenolic ripening, the, the, the tannic ripening. So there are many different aspects that you can never reach in a bad exposed vineyard. Yeah. So said this, it is correct to change, especially on the agronomic side, some techniques. For example, what we did, we increased the height of the canopy to have more shading because you know yeah. the canopy is higher our hills are quite steep so it, when the when the sun turns you have more shading yeah so we did that you have also a higher percentage of active leaves uh, which are doing the photosynthesis that's extremely mm. important we were never aggressive on the green harvest because luckily our vineyards are already very old 50 60 70 till 80 years old so especially the more, single vineyard. more natural balance exactly in there. bravissimo yeah. exactly and especially with the organic method we notice that the resilience so that the, the, the vines they already know how and what to produce yeah. because they are you know really extremely leaked in, in the ter with the terroir in which they are planted it's interesting when you say the organic matter i always I always uh, when, when i when i talk about chemical fertilizer and organic fertilizer and composting my my thoughts are that chemical fertilizer is like cocaine for mm. vines they get a they get a quick hit and they go yay and then they go oh and they crash. no so good <laughs> and then uh, but with the with the compost and things it's more gentle yeah it's very um, true it's very true yeah. What you said is very true. It takes more time, yeah. but it's very gentle. It's natural. It's not like a shock. Mm. Uh, it's not like you are adding so much uh, nitrogen or potassium mm. or mm, phosphorus, whatever, mm. all together at the same time. So the mineral fertilizers are good if you are playing short. Mm -hmm. We are doing, for example, our um, organic compost. Yeah, and this time, at this time of the year in Italy, we have just finished to manure all the all the vineyards, and especially yeah. in a vintage like this one that was dry mm. and, and warm. Mm. It's important, you know, to recover the the soil, to manure it, and uh, to let it rest, waiting for some rain. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I imagine that that uh, as everyone, I guess, in the industry knows, it builds water holding capacity as well. So yeah, the, yeah, 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 there's yeah, yeah, more yeah. access to to water uh, throughout the year. Well, what you said is is extremely important. Um, in fact, uh, after this kind of vintage, we learned from 2003, 2007, yeah. which were warm. Mm. Uh, this time of the of the year, straight after the harvest, after um, after after the vintage, we start moving the soil soil quite heavily mm. in the vineyards. We use a machine called the ripper, so we really cut the grass yeah. 40, 50, 60 centimeters okay. underground mm -hmm. and we, we, we really move it and turn yeah. it, mm. adding manure mm -hmm. and letting the water mm. go in. In the organic vineyards, of course, we are not using herbicides. So what does it mean? It means that you have the, 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 the grass is thick, mm. Mm -hmm. is yes. thick mm. and it covers all, all over the vineyard. It's thick, so after the summertime, in the in the in the, in, in the autumn, it's thick and almost waterproof. Yeah. So if it rains, the water goes straight it, off the top. Exactly. Yeah. So it's important to cut it, 
open the soil and let the water come in during the winter time. Extremely important. There's, there's so many different ways of doing this and so many different approaches, but I think we're seeing a, a fair consensus around the world that the aim is to drive root systems as deep as you can to a more stable environment for temperature, for moisture, uh, and, and allow the vines to be vital during the growing season and particularly at the end when we want to build those as you say those uh, phenolics uh, oh, yeah. like the flavor and the oh, yeah. tannin that's that's when all of that happens and comes together and I, I think what i've seen over over the years drinking barolos across now you know i've, tr I've tried barolo from around 70 years old from today and uh, up to today and then i've tasted through lots of these hot vintages mm -hmm. And there's been a perception around, oh, you don't buy from hot vintage. But what I've seen is incredible work in the vineyard and in the winery to understand how to manage the vineyard and the fruit in the winery in a hot year. And the results are incredible. We're seeing oh, yeah. very good wines, exceptional wines come out of warm years that historically, you know, when, 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 when people saw that, they go, oh, it's, it's not going to be any good. But now you, you pour the wine in the glass don't tell them what the year is, and then yeah, yeah. it's fantastic. Uh, no, I, I agree. I, our duty <clears throat> is to make a great wine every vintage. Yeah. Let's yeah. say this. But it's true, we are getting more, more we have, we're having more experience right now mm. uh, with warm vintages. And um, I always like to say that to me, the warm vintages are, I call them agronomic vintages. Mm. Because the wine was like 2022, the wine was made in the vineyard. Mm. So. Okay. That this, this quote in, in Italy that I'm trying to translate, it is, in the cellar, you can just ruin what you did in the vineyard. Yeah. But if, yeah. You, don't have, if you don't have good fruit, you cannot make a great yeah. wine. But with, yeah. with, with good fruit, you can actually make, it, make a yeah. bad wine, actually. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. And that's, that's a very common saying in, in Australia as well. So the uh, point is that <clears throat> these vintages, if you were able to preserve the pH, the acidity, mm. uh, the freshness, the richness of the fruit, avoid the sunburn, berries, this and that, then you can have a great wine, yeah. Yeah. which is different. Yeah. It doesn't mean that, uh, that that's the beauty of, you know. And I think that's what we've been seeing with, with wines from Barolo. It's, it's, it's not as much a case of things being up and down. It's more a case of um, celebrating the differences between exactly. years. Exactly, exactly. I translate what you were talking about as looking to maintain freshness and energy in your wines, uh, and 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 that, that the, the and wonderful harmony in your wines. That's where those pH factors come in, and 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 that making sure that you're getting uh, phenolic ripeness comes in. But tell you what, how about we taste some wine and talk wine and yeah. and throw in some things around that as well. We threw on an extra wine that wasn't on the tasting list. So introduce us to Timorasso. Tell us about what Timorasso is, what it, what it, what it means for you, and, and this wonderful project that you've got going. I'm very happy we added this wine to the, to the, to the flight of products we are, we are having. Because Timorasso, it's uh, uh, my cousins Isabella and my project. Yes. Together with two friends, these two guys are uh, the owner of a beautiful restaurant in La Morra called mm -hmm. the More Macine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are very, Isabella and I, we are very, very good friends with them. They are wine lovers, so they have a beautiful restaurant and very, very passionate about wine. And together we decided to, to try to start this new experience in the Timorasso area. Mm -hmm. So luckily there's <coughs> my cousin Isabella, who's the one that's taking care of, you know, she's the most responsible among the four of us yeah. because, because <laughs> the, the two other partners and myself, we are completely crazy. Luckily there's Isabella that at a certain point she's like, okay, please stop. Let's write down what we need to do. This is why women are in charge. Exactly. That, yeah. That's why she's the big boss. She's yeah. the big boss. Yeah. She's the big boss and we are working with her. No, but it's a, it's a project that was born by friendship. Uh, friendship and really true uh, and genuine uh, wine passion. And this is really, really important because very often we say that wine is meant to be shared, wine is meant to be, mm. to be drunk together with friends, and that's what really, really happened. So uh, we acquired a, a parcel in the Timorasso area, it's, which it's is... context the area, yeah, exactly. so if you have exactly. a look at where Barolo is... So Barolo, Piedmont, so there's the planet Earth, yeah. Europe, yeah. Italy, yeah. Piedmont, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, 
Piedmont, northwest of Italy, southern part of Piedmont is where the Barolo and the Barbaresco area are. We are talking with the Tiborasso uh, about the Colli Tortonesi area. Mm -hmm. Tortona, it's a city halfway in between Turin and Milan. Mm -hmm. So it's one hour and a half, uh, one hour and a half if you are Italian, if you are American, it's like three hours uh, <laughs> driving, <laughs> uh, driving uh, um, east, so northeast, closer to, to Milan, yeah. and that's the city of Tortona. Tortona, the ancient Latin name of Tortona is Dertona, mm. that gives the name to the denomination. That's mm -hmm. called the Tortonesi Timorasso Dertona, it's the mm -hmm. DOC. So Timorasso is the grape variety? Exactly, exactly. Yep. Timorasso is the grape variety that's grown in the Colli Tortonesi area and the denomination is called Dertona. So Timorasso variety, Dertona mm -hmm. area around the city of Tortona, still in Piedmont, but it's like one hour and a half driving uh, east from where we are. It's a variety that almost disappeared. Yeah. Mm. This variety almost disappeared. It's impossible to talk about Timorasso without mentioning Walter Massa. He makes fantastic wines. There's those, some of those on the, on the list, so look out for them too. It's impossible to mention because, again, as before I said, I, we must be very respectful to what my grandfather's, my mom's generation did before than us. Uh, we also must be very respectful to some producers, first of all, Walter Massa, and then other great wineries like La Colombera, Claudio Mariotto, mm -hmm. Marina Coppi. There's plenty of good producers. Mm -hmm. Thanks to especially Walter Massa, this variety didn't disappear because it was almost disappearing. It was almost disappearing. 25 years ago, there were like, I think, two and a half hectares of Timorasso planted yeah. in the whole world. Yes. Now it's Crazy. like 150, yeah. 170. Not, not, it's not a lot, but I mean, it's like... And this, is, this is something I love about Piedmont, uh, the respect for some of these old varieties and looking for opportunities to explore using mm -hmm. them again. And a lot of those opportunities have come about because science and understanding yeah. have improved. Yeah. So you can manage disease that would, exactly. may have wiped out the crop in, in the past. So we have Timorasso. Um, Ah, nice, to a degree. Oh, yeah. Uh, Nascetta. Nascetta, of and course. Erba Luce from Caruso. Yeah. From oh, the Alto love. Piemont. Amazing, amazing. Oh, I love Erba Luce. Right. I think that Timorasso fits very well in the Piemontese portfolio of indigenous varieties because it's really worth aging. It's an aristocratic white wine. Yeah. Aronese, it's amazing, but it's usually... 90% of the time meant to be drunk a little bit fresher. Yeah. Timorasso it's a wine that loves to age mm. and can age, especially the bottle aging in my opinion helps this wine a lot. Yeah. So we acquired a parcel over there thanks to Walter who's a very good friend we found and thanks to him that the, the, the variety did not disappear. Uh, we uh, acquired a parcel in Monleale mm -hmm. which is this little tiny village uh, uh, in the Colli Tortonesi area and we started making it. Mm. So also the label is slightly different and the packaging is slightly different. Everything is made at Oderos, but it's because it's our project of mm -hmm. Isabella, my cousin, and uh, the two other partners. So mm. it's, I really believe in Tutimorasso. And now there's a new, it's, it's, there's a renaissance. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, lots of good producers from our area are starting doing Timorasso. And so it's, uh, it's interesting. It's a variety that's rising. I think it's going to be a real evolution because we've got some old plantings that yeah. uh, have wonderful fruit and we've got some very young plantings. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the young plantings, I think sometimes at the moment, they come across a little bit neutral. Yeah. But when you see fruit from older vines, the personality that comes through, the texture that comes through um, it's, is, it, is amazing. It is very, very true what you said. We, when we mm, acquired a parcel, it was not planted. So we planted it. And uh, because our vines are young, because of that, we, I'm, I'm very honest about it, this, this wine is still with a big percentage of uh, purchased grapes. Mm. Okay. And we wanted to have grapes from an older vi uh, vineyard. Mm. So we found a very serious uh, grape producer um, who has a 20 years old vineyard mm. and we are sourcing from him mm. Mm. to balance that. Yeah. Can I quickly ask, like, uh, you say it's a great variety for aging, what, what can you expect to develop uh, over time in Timorasso? 
Well, start with what it's like when it's young, oh, and yeah. then tell yeah. us what it's like when it's old. So, when it's young, it's good. When it's old, it's also good. <laughs> Done. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when it's young, um, I mean, Timorazzo it's a difficult variety to grow and to, and to vinify. Uh, we try to preserve the purity of the fruit, so we don't like to play on, you know, the uh, oxidative notes. Uh, the, the purity of the fruit, in my opinion, is really important and needs to be preserved during the, the whole vinification. Uh, when gets older, tends to be, uh, let's say this, I had all the Timorassos, but not from us. So my experience is limited. Mm. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm really, really honest because I can judge others, people, other producers, all Timorasso, but we started this project four years ago. So I, I don't have my personal experience, but what I can tell you is that ages very well. Mm. It keeps the, it's a, it's a red variety dressed like a white variety. Yeah. Completely agree. And, uh, and so it is. I, I never like it when people start saying, ah, this is a white Barolo. That's, that's a, a bad way to describe it, yeah. a very bad way to describe it. But it's true that it has uh, a, a, red, a red variety uh, texture yeah. and uh, finesse. I think that if at the beginning you're vinifying it uh, correctly, you can preserve the purity of the fruit, then it evolves, in the, it becomes uh, deeper, but never oxidized and never tired, it, 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 it evolves. Mm. Uh, it has a secondary aromas, um, very, we are vinifying it also 50% of the production in the wood, big yes. barrels, big casks, uh, so no, no bricks, but the big ones, Austrian oak, so to preserve again the fruit and, and protect the wine, but giving some deepness uh, uh, given by the, by just, the, just by just the wood. I'm going to add a bit of context to some of the things yeah. that you're saying. So it's interesting when you talk about it being more like a, a, a red wine, a lot of Italian whites, and particularly I think with Timorasso, you get a, a very significant textural uh, impact from phenolics. And you can see wonderful phenolics are sort of like white wine tannins, uh, if you want. They're a bit smaller than the tannins you yeah. see in red wine as a compound, but they, they add a lot of texture. Yeah. And you see that texture in this, in this, this wine. Uh, it adds an incredible amount of intrigue and interest and, and, it, and it comes along with some pithy characters as well and some beautiful acid and some wonderful depth of fruit. When you're talking about not being oxidative and not, uh, but keeping the fresh fruit there, it's very interesting from a European perspective that means something very different than an Australian perspective. Mm. From an Australian perspective, we'd be seeing in a, in a wine you describe as being fresh and fruity, something that's a lot more primary and, mm. and, and, and very raw fruit characters. I still see wonderful development in this one. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. it's not like lolly water. No. It's, it's got development without necessarily being oxidized. Yeah. And I guess the final point, just to put something in, in, in context around wood size, when you have a very big barrel Barrels are porous and little bits of oxygen get in, little bits Definitely. of moisture get out. But the bigger the barrel, the slower the rate of oxidation. So you can control the maturation much yeah. more specifically than if you're in a very small barrel where the oxidation would be occurring faster. 100%. So I it's very important also the thickness mm. of the barrels. Aust the, the wine, the, 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 sorry, the wood we are using, it's coming from Austria. Austrian coopers were born to produce barrels for white wines. And to last a thousand years. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's why we are working. We like a lot Austrian oak also for our Barolos, mm -hmm. but for we are working with a cooper called Stockinger. Very uh, famous cooper. My mom, I gotta say that uh, she started uh, buying Stockinger when it was not trendy, more than 20 years ago. Mm. So we have a very long and established relationship with him. And uh, I like to say because it's, it's very trendy right now because his barrels are amazing. We really started uh, years ago, more than 20 years ago. These coopers were started producing big barrels to protect the white wines because they don't need too much oxygen as the red wines during the aging time, but giving depth and uh, complexity. 
Yeah, so it's important also the thickness of the of the of the barrels for the white wines. They are much thicker than the ones we use for mm. for red. Yeah, yeah. So for for context again, uh, a standard barrique might be twenty five mil thick uh, in the stave, a thick stave thirty five mil thick. For a for a for a bottle like you, sixty sometimes more. Um, but 60 is a very thick piece of timber. 60, the, yeah, the, we never go more than uh, a little bit not as thick, the, 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 the red ones, uh, thicker the, the whites. The whites, yeah, 60 or 65 also. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think the other important thing to say is with Stockinger, Stockinger works very closely with the wineries mm. to try and match the the barrels that are, are used to the wines yeah. that are, are being produced and thinks, yeah. thinks very, very carefully about that. Yeah. Um, obviously, when a barrel is new and young, it will impart some character. As it becomes older, it's fairly neutral. But it's it's a very hard thing for a winemaker to do to find yeah. the right oak mix for their fruit. It's, it's very difficult, and uh, because with Timorasso we have such a small production now, it's increasing. And the, the, the only big barrels, which is 3,000 liters, uh, we are using, it's new. Mm. We are doing also the fermentation inside to rinse and yeah. Yeah. to, yeah. you know, balance the, 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 the oakiness of yeah. the new wood. So yeah. the fermentation is done inside. Yeah. We let the wine with fine leaves in there. We don't do too many... Um, I don't know how to call it in English, you know, when you are moving the, the stirring leaves. Stirring the leaves. Stirring, exactly. <clears throat> we don't do that too, too often, but uh, of course at the beginning more and then less. Uh, and the, the rest is in stainless yeah. steel and then they're yeah. planned. So what Pietro was talking about there is how, uh, what, what the French call élevage, élevage. and we, right. we call perhaps aging in barrel and how you choose to develop the wine, how quickly you introduce again oxygen because oxygen helps develop the fruit, fruit characters and also helps develop the texture and the tannins. Um, I'll pass over to Maddie to, to kick on while I answer the door. <laughs> uh, so. Um, well, I guess maybe we'll move on to the, the next one. Go for it. Yeah. yeah, so, Dolcetto. Dolcetto. Dolcetto, together with Barbera and Nebbiolo, is one of hey. the three most important guy, indigenous mate. red varieties of, uh, of beer. <coughs> Dolcetto is a wine that I like a lot because it's a, it's an everyday wine. It's an everyday wine in the most uh, important and noble uh, meaning. My grandfather loves to say that if you want to judge a Barolo producer or a Barbaresco producer, you need to taste first their Dolcetto. Okay, why? Because Dolcetto, even if it's an everyday wine, it's a very difficult and delicate variety. So it's hard to make a great Dolcetto. You can mm -hmm. see how a producer is um, gentle and delicate with his, uh, with his vineyards, with his vines, mm -hmm. um, from the Dolcetto because uh, Dolcetto suffers when there's too much rain, suffers when there's too much sun, the steam is very delicate, it suffers all the time. Oh, it's kind of a prima donna. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, bravissima. So, um, Dolcetto is intended to be drunk uh, as uh, really uh, everyday wine and in, in, the most, uh, in the most beautiful way because it's really, to me Dolcetto it's a very dangerous wine because if you leave a bottle of Dolcetto over here I can drink a bottle by myself very easily in like 30 minutes <laughs> and it, that's how we think about Dolcetto. Um, one of the most difficult things the hardest things in, in, in the wine world are to be simple. It's very mm. hard to be mm. simple. Mm. And so to preserve the purity, uh, it's an accessible wine. And it's this with, this with this kind of wines that we really establish and build a wine culture. Because mm. this is a wine that's affordable by everybody. Absolutely. Yes. It's yeah. a wine that you can drink when you are young, you can drink when you are old, you can drink while during the summertime, during the wintertime as an aperitivo, yeah. uh, eating some food. So it's with this kind of wines, such as Barbera and Langanebiolo too, that you really establish a wine culture. Absolutely. I think these wines, these uh, Dolcetto, Barbera, Langanebiolo are incredibly important. They're great introductions. Your Dolcetto intrigues me. Um, Dolcetto, I, I, I have a problem with Dolcetto. Oh, okay. And it's not all Dolcetto. It's, it depends on who's making it, obviously. Mm -hmm. But quite often I find Dolcetto to be too primary in the Australian context. It's like just 
under, underdeveloped and a bit reduced. You know, mm. these, these soul fire characters. Dolcetto. Your Dolcetto are very different to that. It's, it is beautifully developed as some lovely savory characters, yet retaining lovely fresh fruit and energy there. Dolcetto is the variety that suffers reduction the most among our wines. Mm. You should come straight after the harvest, you press the Dolcetto, you let <laughs> it, it macerate, <laughs> then it goes in the tank after three days, it stinks. It doesn't matter if it's yours, if it's someone else's, Dolcetto. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I know that uh, every producer has this same problem, but it's, yeah. it's related to the variety. It's yeah. normal, it's completely normal. You let it breathe, you rack it, yeah. and then it goes away. But straight after the vinification, you let it rest like a few days in the tank yeah. and then it's yeah. always reduced, always, yeah. always reduced. I remember my grandfather telling me that when they were digging out the skins from the tank, they used to put like, uh, in the, when you're digging out, you are separating the skins from the mast after the maceration process. And then um, what you do, you open the door the big, the, the big door of the, of the wooden vat at the bottom because our dolcetto stays just in stainless steel. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, not wooden vat, the stainless steel vat yeah. uh, because this wine stays uh, just in the stainless steel and then you dig the, yeah. uh, the skins. And you have like a big, uh, big bucket underneath where you put the skins, mm -hmm. uh, where you put, sorry, the, the mast and then you pump it in another tank. So over there they used to put uh, big copper items, yes. like, yep. A, yep. like a, a copper pan, a yeah. pot, yeah. something like this, because copper yeah. cleans and, uh, you know, the, the reduction smells yeah. are like... Uh, it's like rotten egg gas. So it's a, hydrogen sulfide is the, is the very first form of reduction. It's, it can smell a little savory, a little like rotten egg gas, and exactly as you're saying, Copper binds to hydrogen sulfide and it takes it out of the out of the wine and yeah. then your wine smells good. Yeah, that's it's much more open and more good. So they used <clears throat> to put like random uh, copper stuff <laughs> over there. So you know, pumping the mast in this big bucket, it, um, the, the fluid, the the, the wine uh, was pumped through this, this 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 just in contact with this yeah. kind of stuff. And uh, it's definitely more clean because yeah. that's what, what copper does. And that's yeah. what we, in Australia, we used to have the one and two cent coins ah, yeah, made of copper. Same. And if you had a, a wine that was reduced, you'd stick a Don't, copper coin in it. Of course, uh, that's what happens, yeah. <laughs> or if it's clo too cloak, uh, uh, copper cleans and opens up the wine. So mm -hmm. it, it, in mm -hmm. the past it was common, you know, I remember to see some, uh, I, my, 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 my family, my grandfather, my mom used to tell me that in the past it, would, it happened at some, uh, some tastings, you know, this wine is closed, it's reduced, tung, yep. a copper inside. Yep. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've got to say, your Dolcetto is beautifully developed. Tell me, how long has this bottle been open? This bottle has been opened uh, seven hours, 45 minutes and 35 <laughs> seconds ago. 36 now, 37, really? Really? 38. Really? No, it's been a couple of days, yeah? <laughs> no, 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 this bottle no. was, no, this bottle was, this bottle was opened yesterday, yesterday morning. Yes, yes. Yeah. yesterday morning. So, Almost two days ago. Yeah. Very important thing yes, to say, yes, and yes. I think this is particularly so for your wines and your red wines, they love time being open. Yeah. They love a couple of days being open. If, you, if you're gonna drink a, a wine from Odero, get prepared, particularly when they're younger, and open them, stick them in a decanter um, to help, help bring them, Let them breathe. Bring, bring them forward. And, and quite often you'll find that if you leave a little bit in a bottle, particularly of the Barolos, four or five days later is the best it's tasted. It's uh, it's insane. So yeah, yeah, our wines they need to need to breathe in general. Nebbiolo need to breathe. I don't like always to decant, especially yeah. the young Nebbiolos. Yeah. Because with this kind of glasses, I like to see the evolution during a meal yeah. from the first yeah. glass to the last one we, after like one hour, two hours. But it's a problem. We, we drink too fast. That's <laughs> our problem. So. <laughs> but I agree with you that uh, this wine was open like uh, almost two days ago, and in general, with some hair, they. They, they develop. Yeah, I agree. Well, I've got to say, I think this is a really good chance, particularly with uh, wines like the Dolcetto, Barbera and Lange Neb, to try wines side by side. Let me just grab that and perhaps start talking about uh, Barbera. Barbera. Yeah, so Dolcetto and Barbera, but how they, they, yeah, similarly different? And... Yeah, very different uh, because uh, in, in, the, in the aging, uh, the, the, wine, the vinification process, so 
um, Barbera together with Dolcetto and Nebbiolo, it's uh, a very important variety uh, from, uh, from Piedmont. Yes. Barbera can be quite vigorous, so it's important to control the production and the yield because it's quite a vigorous um, variety. Usually it's fruit driven, has a higher acidity in general, mm -hmm. uh, that keeps the wine, we never, we never touch it, we never play on the acidity in the, in the cellar, we keep it very natural and that, um, the acidity keeps the wine alive and crunchy, mm. otherwise yeah. it can be a little bit flat and boring and just too fruity. Yeah. So the acidity is very important for Barbera. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's one of his natural you know, characteristics. Mm. This wine is coming from La Morra and Castiglione Falletto, mm -hmm. so two vineyards blended and vinified together. Mm -hmm. And it's aged, it's superiore, it's called superiore Barbera when it's aged longer than one year. And this wine ages for one year in uh, the big Slavonian barrels. Mm -hmm. Slavonia, which is not Slovenia, people very often get confused. And uh, I remember like uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had a, a visit at the winery and this guy said to me, oh, you said all, the whole time Slavonia, I just want to correct you, that's Slovenia. And I was like, um, you know, th thank you very much for your unrequested advice, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but it's Slavonia, it's not Slovenia. I know what I said and it's... Uh, it's uh, yeah, but have you ever seen the Slavonian flag? And I was like, no, but I mean, it's, it's not a nation. It is a, it yeah. is a, a, it is a, a geographical region, eastern part of Europe. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so it ages over there for um, 12 months and then a passage of at least six months in the bottle. Yeah. It and makes such a difference. Oh, yeah, you can, yeah, yeah. You can 100%. have that extra time. But Bear in general loves more than uh, Nebbiolo's heat, the warm sides, because of the acidity. The acidity tends mm. to be sharp, mm. and so the heat, the sun, helps the acidity to be more, you know, melted and integrated into the texture of the wine. Yeah. So, in general, the warm vintages are better for Barberas than Nebbiolo's in general. Uh, again, our duty is to make a great wine always, but the best sites for Barbera are the warm ones. And it's interesting because there's a lot of Barbera sites that were ripped up and replaced with Nebbiolo when mm -hmm. Barolo mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. becoming popular. And there's, there's a lot of people that would say that you get a more consistent result from Barbera to Asti. Uh, than Barbera yeah. to Elba because the, the vineyards are very specific. Yeah, for, it's true. Yeah. We do both. We do both Barbera d'Alba and Barbera d'Asti. Uh, that's uh, the newest denomination of Piedmont called Nizza. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the Barbera d'Asti area. And uh, it's true what you said. Also because we have to think that uh, on one hand it's correct that the best exposure in our region are planted with Nebbiolo. Mm. To have Barolo or to have Barbaresco. Mm. Over there, Barbera in the Asti area, which is like 20 minutes away, from the Lange area, over there, the best sites are planted with Barbera because Barbera mm. is their most important variety. Yeah. So yeah. the yeah. consistency in the Barbera Dusty region, it's very high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. It's true. I think there's some, some general differences as well. You know, Barbera de Elba, for me, you, t you tend to see that there's more red fruits and that's that sort of generosity in Barbera de Asti tends to be a little bit more earthy and almost yeah. uh, yes. uh, yes. savoury. Yes. Um, but it's, it's very true. A case of celebrating the differences. I love try trying uh, a Barbera de Elba and a Barbera de Asti from the same producer because they both give pleasure, but they're both different. Yes, uh, and, uh, yes, 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 yes. <clears throat> it's true. It's true. So, well, hey, thank you for, for introducing those wines. I think it's time to try some uh, Nebbiolo. So we're going to yeah. pour a Lange Nebbiolo and we've got a really good opportunity to try two Barolo side by side from, or two different vintages, the 17 and the 18. This is something I recommend you guys do at home as well. Try with context and in contrast. If you can put at least two wines side by side, you'll get so much more out of it. You can compare them much more easily and say, this one's a bit more like fruity, or this one's uh, got a bit more tannin, or whatever it might be. And it's not a case of finding a winner, but just learning and evolving and finding See the differences. differences. Yeah, yeah so. because very often we talk about vintages, but it's, it's good to taste them and to see the vintages side by side, Absolutely. see the differences. It's not just something we are talking about. It, it's real. Yeah. It's there. Okay. And if, you're, and if you're opening a few bottles at a time, you can always drink them over several days. Your Barolos undoubtedly will hold over several days. Um, if, it's, if it's an older wine, you can potentially core in them uh, or use something like that. Um, so 
lots of different ways to, to do this. So we're going to pour the 2020 uh, Lange Nebbiolo. While we're doing that, tell us about... Now, I'm going to preface this with I hate talking about vintages as a generalisation because for me it's about what's in the glass and whether that's good no matter what year it comes from. But having said that, I'm going to go against it. How was 2020 like for you? 2020 was a beautiful vintage. It's impossible to complain about 2020. Uh, such as 19 or 2021, um, it's, um, it was beautiful. Yep. Beautiful, very traditional. Uh, traditional, it means not too hot, not too, not too cold, very classic. We finished the second, we finished the harvest the second half of October. Um, so very, very classic. So I remember 2020 was a difficult year for the entire world, but at least the harvest was so smooth, easy, very healthy grapes and very, um, Easy harvest, easy in the fact that I remember that some vin some vineyards where we usually uh, where, where, when it usually takes like a couple of days to pick them all in 2020 we finished early because uh, earlier because uh, it was uh, the, the the crop was super healthy so it was easy yeah. you know cut and go tum 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 no no so, triage triage really no 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 triage. so no not too much selection in yeah. the vineyards even if we are always doing it but because the grapes looked really really beautiful I like mm -hmm. a lot the ten the twenty sorry yeah yeah twenty it's a beautiful vintage and I think that if you're not used to drink Nebbiolos mm -hmm. this is the best way to start with yeah yeah a Lange Nebbiolo or specifically the twenty twenty <laughs> Specifically on Dero. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, it's, Lange... it's true because some people make their Lange Nebbiolo to be quite structured and, and really needs much more time before you can approach it. We do not intend our Lange Nebbiolo mm. as a baby Barolo. Mm. It's a different wine. It's a Nebbiolo. It's a Nebbiolo. Yeah. So, no, in general, 2020, but Lange Nebbiolo in general, it's a, it's, it's a good... Uh, even... And even if I, I, every producer has his own style, has his own philosophy, but uh, for sure it's a good product to start with, to educate your palate to tannins, to, to the texture and the structure typical of a Nebbiolo wine. So for sure, in general, Lange Nebbiolo is a good wine and 2020 also a good vintage to start with. Mm -hmm. I was saying that we do not intend our Lange Nebbiolo as a baby Barolo. What does it mean? It means that the grapes that we are using are coming from the Barolo region from a vineyard that actually could be vinified as a Barolo because it's in La Morra and it's a MGA of Barolo. Mm -hmm. So a geographical mention of Barolo. But an, an MGA is a, a specific uh, vineyard that has been classified. Uh, exactly, and, and a single has, vineyard. Yeah. But <clears throat> we decided to dedicate the production of this wine in that specific spot because of the seriousness. So tannins and texture are there, yes. but needs to be pure, elegant, enjoyable, mm -hmm. uh, balanced and uh, smooth in the mouth. So mm -hmm. that's why I do not intend it as a baby Barolo. Barolo yeah. is another, another stuff, <clears throat> Barbaresco is another stuff. Langne Biolo needs to be a good approach to the variety, serious but balanced and fruit driven. It's interesting that Pietro, talk, you, you talk about the Langne Biolo like that, there's a few things that come to mind immediately for me. Uh, one is you're talking about Lamora. So Lamora in general uh, for me, and this is, this, is, this is where I'll happily fall on my sword uh, and, and, and would love to hear how you compare different communes and we'll talk about that a bit later on. But Lamora tends to be a little bit more accessible mm -hmm, than, mm -hmm. say, something like say, an, an area like Monforte uh, and some of the bolder vineyards in Monforte Sarah and, and Serra Lunga yeah. as well that can be very structured. Definitely. Um, so when we're talking about Nebbiolo, for me, one of the biggest things and most important things to talk about is mouthfeel and texture. That's one of the, the, the most important things about Nebbiolo for me. And we're not necessarily talking with Nebbiolo about overwhelming fruit we're talking about uh refined earthy savory secondary characters but yet still with a core of fruit yeah is that how you see nebbiolo as well yes is it? yes yes and and, and lamora is in, in, in lamora in general uh, is uh, <clears throat> like uh, lamora um, verduno a part of barolo 
a, a little maybe a bit of novello uh, yeah novello too uh, very different from the other side of the Barolo era like uh, Castiglione like uh, Sarah Luca and Monforte so yeah I completely agree with uh, with you uh, La Mora tends to be in general more accessible yeah. due to the composition of the soil due to, to the microclimate I have to say this that an exception is the beautiful single vineyard Brunate mm. that we are doing too that's more Brunate than La Morra so mm -hmm. usually it's considered the Serra Lunga of La Morra because yes Brolos from La Morra are very smooth, floral and more accessible but Brunate is different, it's another story yep. within the La Morra village but yes it's true, it's mainly given by um, yeah, the, the, the altitude uh, and the composition of the soil. Mm. In La Morra, there's a specific soil, what we call the La Morra conglomerates. So it's, okay. it's um, quite easy in La Morra to find like um, 50, 60 centimeters underground until one, two, three, five meters. Mm. What they're called the La Morra conglomerates. What are the La Morra conglomerates? Are big stones, mm. very soft. Mm. They crumble very easily yeah. because they are compressed sand. So it's a sea sedimentary soil. Mm. Mm. Compressed sand that created, you know, when you go at the beach and you press the sand, yep. try to imagine it after thousands, 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 millions of years, it creates these big stones, super light. They crumble easily, very, very easily. But this makes the soil softer. Mm not as compact as the other side of the Barolo area where there's more limestone, calcareous deposits, marl, the hard limestone that's called marl, mm. marne blu. Mm -hmm. um, La Mora soil it's definitely mm, softer, keeps the water a little bit more um, and uh, not as, as compact as the other side. So that mm. makes the biggest difference because mm. Nebbiolo you have to think that it's probably one of the variety together with Pinot Noir and with other great varieties uh, all over the world. Uh, Nebbiolo is a variety that's very much related uh, into the soil in which it's planted. So mm. even if the area is very small, the expressions of Nebbiolo are so different from one hill to another because it changes the soil and ge geologically speaking our area is super interesting because mm. from one hill to another you have Helvetian soil, Tortonian soil, mm. sedimentary soil, so it's mm. completely different. The soils that uh, Pietro is talking about, we've talked about before, so I'll stick a map up and show you some of them. Some people call uh, um, the, uh, uh, use the name Ceruluvian, yes. uh, Ceralunga, uh, for, the, for those soils on the Monforte, Ceralunga, parts of Castiglione, Filetto um, side of things. Yes. Um, but soil does make a huge difference. Uh, I'd be very interested. You, you had a question talking about precision viticulture and things like that. You were sort of interested in... Yeah, just... Well, I guess not necessarily as it relates to soil, but like, uh, and you mentioned this sort of before about how you're changing how you manage canopies. Are you introducing different techniques in different parts of, uh, in different sort of communes and denominations to bring out different characters or to emphasize, you know, a La Mora or a Serlunga? Or... Yes. I think that uh, probably our most important asset is the experience. So mm. okay. we have the a huge knowledge of the single vineyards of mm -hmm. Barolo and Barbaresco we are producing because it's really centuries that my family is vinifying them yeah. so yes it's um, for us it's not even uh, it's not even it's it's already normality saying ah in Rocca di Castiglione we are doing this because the soil is like this and the vines are like this and the exposure is like this so it's it's not even precision viticulture it's because it's, it is what it is. I mean, yes. it, we are so used to do that because mm. we know that, uh, that, that, that the vineyard is expressing itself in a certain way that uh, I, it's, it's, it's difficult for me to call it um, precision, viticultural precision, because it's, it, it's what we do already. Yeah. It's very different, yeah. by the way. No, I think it's, it's, it's very, very different. From Villero to Rocca di Castiglione, sorry to interrupt, but mm. from Villero to Rocca di Castiglione, even if they are so close and both in Castiglione and Falletto, two completely different words, yeah. Yeah. two completely yeah, different absolutely. words, and we are farming the vineyards in a completely different way, that's completely. Yeah, yeah. And so, although these vineyards are next to each other, uh, I think you guys have got to realise that vineyards can vary from almost from, well, literally from row to row. Uh, there can be a slight fold in the, in the hill and a slight change oh, yeah. in soil. 
if you've had a lot of experience working with your vineyards, you end up with an innate touch and an ability to read which parts of the vineyard you need to, to deal with and, and that, that you, you know, I don't think you've named every vine yet, have you? <laughs> Not yet? Not all of them. Not all of them. Just for me. example, I can tell you this. <laughs> Third row, fourth yeah, no, vine, left. And your dog peed on it. And, uh, in uh, sort my, of September or something. My dog helps yeah. a lot with the natural, <laughs> natural manuring uh, of the vineyard. Uh, my dog, if you come, I'll, I'll introduce to her because she's the mascot of the winery. She's amazing. Uh, I, can't, uh, I can't wait. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're sharing dog photos now. So, it's uh, really cool. <laughs> so guys, we've got some... Um, I've actually kept back some Lange Nebbiolo from a few producers, and one of them is Odero. So I have 18, 19, and 20 uh, will be available as well. This 20, I, I'm really loving it. I, there's a lovely perfume there. It is quintessentially Nebbiolo, uh, and quintessentially, though, it's, it is quite approachable now. And it's, it's a wine that you can get a lot of pleasure from. It's been beautifully developed. Oh, the alavage has been, been wonderful. So it is very together. It is quite plush as, it, as Nebbiolos go. Um, how did you find it? I love it. I, I think it's definitely... A the thing I love about Nebbiolo is the smell. Like yeah. you can just sit there and, and you really get that primary Nebbiolo character from this. It's almost like yeah. smelling a strawberry. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, as you give it time, you get more of that complexity coming through. But yep. I, I really like the distinction you were talking about before that it's Lange Nebbiolo, it's not a baby Barolo, no. and it is really going to mm. the purity of the Nebbiolo. Yep. And so we go into a pair of wines now, and it, it's the two Barolos. 17 and 18, there's a lot to talk about with these. Oh, yeah. A lot of things happened. Um, a lot of things happened. A lot of things happened. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 17 tell, and 18. Tell us, tell us about um, 17 and 18 for you, however you want. I don't care whether you talk about the vintage or just the wines, whatever. What, what's, what's important for you with these wines? The most important things to say is that uh, um, 17 and 18 were... I'll, I'll always like to talk um, first about the weather condition because everything starts from there, starts mm -hmm. from the vineyard. Completely different. 17, it reminds me a little bit 2022. Mm -hmm. Quite warm, warm and dry, yep. very dry. Yep. We didn't have rain for like four months mm -hmm. in 2017, almost like 2022. Luckily, 18, 19, 20 and 21, we're more classic, mm -hmm. we're more uh, richer in, in, in rain too, rich in, in, mm -hmm. in water. While the 17 was very dry, very dry. And definitely more anticipated an early vintage compared mm -hmm. to the 2018. Mm -hmm. We finished roughly two, we finished to pick roughly two weeks before than the 2018. Wow. So it was very anticipated because yep. of the drought and because mm -hmm. of the heat. It's important to taste the two vintages side by side, in my opinion, because they really help. They really help you to understand how a producer is farming their vineyards. Um, we we talked before about uh, the difference between the vintages and uh, the importance of the difference between the vintages, and really that's that that's the case. And. Uh, my suggestion is always if you have never tried anything from a specific producer and you get the chance to try like in the Barolo or Barbaresco area, the 17 and the 18 side by side, really helps you to understand the philosophy behind because yeah. they're opposite vintages. 17 is again, as I said, said um, warm and dry, the 18 much cooler and much more humid. Mm. In 2018, we decided not to do all the single vineyards mm -hmm. because unfortunately there was a big hailstorm mm -hmm. that decreased the production of lots of single vineyards and also a late frost mm. in April. In fact, in, we do also have one Barbaresco, that's Gallina from Neve Village, that mm -hmm. in 18 was not produced because a night uh, in early April, the temperature went minus five below mm. minus five uh, Celsius. So we lost uh, that night like 40% of the production and we have mm. not produced that wine. So in the 18 vintage, for the conventional producers, it was big yields. Mm. Mm -hmm. For the organic producers, like mm. us in the vineyard where we are organic, low yields. Mm. So we decided to do not produce all the single vineyards. And the biggest differences between these two wines is that they are vinified in the same way. 
aged in the same way, but the grapes inside of the blend yeah. are completely different. Mm. Okay. Because so it, it makes it very hard, doesn't it? When you, when you have all of those events, you've got disease pressure, yeah. you've got frosts, you've got hail. It creates incredible inconsistency in the vineyard. Yeah. So you have millions of berries that are all a little bit different from each other. The, 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 the consistency is from here to here, and you have to be so much more careful as you're picking and as you're processing in the wine. Yes. Whereas if you have a consistent year, as you say, with the 20, you just pick it and it goes yep. in, done, job's done. But you 18, have to spend yeah, no, more no. people, more hours, Ooh, for sure. go hard. And uh, it's usually when you spend more people, more hours, you do more selection in the vineyards, so you spend lots of money, mm. is when you produce less. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So it's, it's exponential, the, the thing, no? yeah. and uh, in 2018, uh, the problem, the biggest problem, it was that we had quite a good amount of rain in May after the flowering, yeah. when the, the berries were like turning, after the flowering time, they turn green and they look like little uh, pepper, pepper Peppercorns, grains, yeah. yeah, it rained a lot during that time, yeah. so the clusters, the clusters, they, they were just starting to close to be, you know, formed. Mm -hmm. And so humidity stays inside of the cluster. Yeah. And so we had uh, afterwards problems with mildew and yeah. peronospora yeah. mainly. So uh, it was not that easy, but again, it's a vintage that reveals the agronomic soul of a winery. Yeah. Yes. And usually in general, vintages are, if they are warmer, they are readier, if they are cooler, they need more time. In my opinion, 17 and 18 is exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. 17, now I like it a lot, but at the beginning it was too tight for me. Mm -hmm. While the 18, even if it was cooler, to me is such a drinkable vintage. Mm -hmm. And we need vintages like the 18 sometimes. Mm -hmm. Meant to be drunk, meant to be open and meant to be enjoyed also now. And this is the thing, and, and we're talking about how uh, producers in Barolo and Barbaresco and, and now continuing into Alto Piemonte, into Valtellina, yeah. you're seeing these producers of Nebbiolo raising the, the base level standard and the consistency of their wines. And so often uh, vintages are not necessarily about which one's better. And of course there are wines that are better than others, but quite often it's about which one should I drink first. Yeah. And sometimes it is the 18, the, the, the younger one before the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the, 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 the older one. Yeah. And I, 100%. I, I see in, in 17 um, exceptional management of the, of the heat and, mm. and in the winery. There, are, there is some, some firmness to tannins, which in a, in a year where maybe there was a bit more hang time, they would have softened a little bit more. But that attack is not out of place. It actually sits there well in the wine. Uh, and, and, and the wine has come together beautifully. There's still harmony in, the, in both of these wines. The 18 was interesting. Uh, Maddie and I had the, the great fortune of tasting about 60 or 70 2018 yeah. Barolos next to each other a couple nice. of weeks ago. Yeah. Nice. Included in that list was your 2018. Oh. Yeah. And it stood out as one of... One of few producers who'd chosen not to make a lot of single vintages, uh, vineyards and mm -hmm. who actually did classify. Yeah. In yeah. fact, in the Barolo Classico 2018, mm -hmm. The biggest difference between the 2017 is that four out of six single vineyards we produce were not uh, vinified on their own. So inside of the Barolo Classico 18, it's a literally a blend of great vineyards because there's inside Villero, yeah, one Rocchi of the di Castiglione, another one of the greats, Bussia, and Monvigliero. Okay. Yeah, it's hard to complain. Those vineyards are all. Um, they're the, the, the crown jewels of their respective communes. Um, you know, Bussi is the one that's hardest to explain because Montforte big, and Bussi yeah. are so big, so you have to dial down into a yeah, exactly, particular exactly, part exactly. of Bussi. Because it's huge, yeah. Did you, did you do a continuous fermentation with those? Did you go old school and just keep picking fruit and adding it to a, the fermentation? No, or you no, do they them were, separately? They, yeah, exactly. And because then, there's uh, too much um, difference in between... Uh, picking time. Exactly, in picking yeah. time. Too okay. much difference. So we vinify them separately, and then after one year, of aging time then separate we put them together okay so yeah. they look they do look harmonious um, but they, they were not co-fermented no yeah. does it make you does it make you want to shift away from cruise and make uh, that's a good some, question some mega blends yeah. that's why in fact I like to call our Barolo classico and not the word entry level that I hate uh, or normale or normale or standard <laughs> or regular 
or like it's like um, what because it makes the wine different on a quality level and it's not it's different on a philosophy of production but not on, on a quality level yeah. mm. and uh, mm, the question is you, you asked is very good but the answer is that again we are very lucky because we have the opportunity on an average vintage to put already inside of the Barolo Classico very important vineyards, yes. such as Bricocchiesa from La Morra, Capalot from La Morra, and Bric del Fiasco, Bricco Fiasco mm. from Castiglione Falletto, uh, that uh, is uh, inside of our Barolo Classico, yeah. already on an average vintage. So the 18 has these three vineyards plus the four single vineyards, while the 17 just the three vineyards. There'd be so many producers that would be quite happy to split those apart and call them individual crews yeah. uh, and charge a lot of money for them. I have a, a lot of respect that you've taken the decision with 2018 to, to make that move and uh, yeah, okay, so you could argue that it's pragmatic because of small volumes and things, but you, you could have still made a, a Valero and a Roque and you've made an exceptional, um, it's, it's almost like the uh, Bordeaux Super Seconds, it's a, mm -hmm. a, a bit of a super, it is a bit of a Super Barolo, I think 2018 probably. Yeah. We, we did in 2018 just Brunate, we are tasting afterwards. Yeah. And Vignarionda 2018, mm. that I can tell you, it's probably the f my favorite wine from a day I've ever had. Wow. Isn't that, isn't yes. that amazing? <laughs> yes. And I think, I think, again, let's highlight the importance of, of judging a wine by what's in the glass, not by what you hear about a vintage. Yeah. Yes. And we have so many times. So let's take Monfortino. How many times has Monfortino been made in what's been perceived to be a bad year and not made in what's perceived to be a good year? And it's so important to try wines without any preconception on vintages and not miss out on opportunities yes. in, in this. I'd like to, to hear, Maddie, what your thoughts are on the differences when you go from a Lange Nebbiolo to two Barolos. What are you um, seeing as, a, as the difference? Well, for me, the thing that sticks out most is sort of the, the structural component. Um, you're still getting a lot of the same uh, sort of aromas and flavour characteristics, though uh, a different level of complexity. But um, just on the palate, like the tannins and the acidity just seem elevated. Mm. Um, it's quite interesting uh, looking at the two vintages because if you had given them to me without knowing which years they were from, I would have actually thought that the 18 was a warmer year. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, just based on like, the, the, the development of each of them. I think it's just that the 18 is, as you say, a bit more upfront and you know, accessible yeah. younger. Um, yeah. And that's, that's probably translating in an Australian experience across to a European yes. thing. And in Europe, I call it the, the um, uh, in, well, particularly in Burgundy, the, uh, the warm year sucker punch uh, mm. that was happening mm. where people in Burgundy were tasting super fruity wines mm -hmm. in Burgundy and, and they were being enamoured by them. But sometimes they were missing out on sort of critical points of balance and texture mm. because it's something they hadn't seen before. Yeah. Um, but sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, I, but... Um, so yeah, really um, going from the Lange to the, the Barolo, for me it's just a bolder structure, it's still incredibly finessed, but um, definitely feel more of the tannin coming through yeah. and more complexity in terms of the, yeah. the flavour. The, do you mean the, the 18 or the 17? Both of them. Both of them. Barolo ah, yeah. compared to Lange yeah. Barolo. Ah, okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting one because I, th I, I certainly think there's more... There's the depth of tannin and layering of tannin that happens when you move from a Lange to a, to a Barolo level. And I think the same thing happens with fruit as well. Yeah. Um, so to, to me, I, th I think, again, what we're seeing is uh, when, when, you, when you have a, a, a great producer, very different years, you still get wines that are, are incredibly delicious to drink. Yeah. In our region, I always say, regarding our wines, not just the there, but the wines from the area, don't drink by vintage, but drink by producer yep. or by vineyard. Yep. Yep. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, I don't like to drink by vintage. I, I had amazing bottles of 2014, which was a vintage quite blamed by the, 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 yep. the critics uh, in, in, in Piedmont. Mm -hmm. And I had amazing bottles from amazing producers. So. Yep. And again, our duty is to make a great wine yeah. always. It's yeah, you yeah, have a look at 14, 11, same sort of scenarios. A lot of people didn't give them respect, but when you get a, you know, good ones in the glass, they're delicious. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And with time too. Exactly, think, yeah, exactly. A lot of you know, professionals, yeah. tasters or critics are getting quite young and trying to predict how they, 
they might and develop. We're going to talk about that when we get to the yeah. Vineyard Rionda as well, because we've got an interesting comparison of 12 and 13. Mm. We're drinking 12, but to talk about it with 13 mm. yes. on the side. So let's, yes, let's yes, pour yes, the, yes, the crew yes. wines. Left to right. Yeah, I love Valero. Valero is one of my favourite vineyards uh, in Barolo, as is Roque de Castiglione. Um, two vineyards that you hold. Um, yeah, beautiful exposure, beautiful vineyard. Oh, and, the, and the good thing about Villera and Rocca di Castiglione too is that we are such in a good company because there are great oh. producers that are doing amazing wines from there. And so it's important to, oh. be, to, be, to be in great company because you know, the more the merrier if we are all doing quality. And in both denominations, uh, there are amazing bottles from different wineries. So it's always nice to 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 do like to to surf from a yeah. vineyard uh, to to another yeah. vineyard from different producers and taste the different styles but the quality is always outstanding exactly there's a couple of monopoles that i think suffer from not having more than one producer because there, there's, no, there's there's not that compare yeah. and contrast yeah. happening yeah. but yeah. so tell us Valero. now we are in castiglione Folletto. yes brunati La we're going to be in la mora and vigna perhaps the most prized vineyard of Serra Lunga. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a few others that are up there, right yeah. up there as well, undoubtedly. But Vigneronda, an incredibly important vineyard uh, for, for Barolo. Tell us, a, tell us about these three wines and, and, the, and the stories behind these. So, it's nice uh, and uh, it's quite a unique opportunity because few wineries have really the, 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 the chance to taste uh, and to produce uh, uh, Barolos coming from such important uh, terroirs in different places. So it's really three uh, communes, three, three very communes, vineyards. three very special vineyards, three iconic vineyards of different communes. So you know, Villero, Castiglione, Brunate, La Morra, Serralunga, Vigneri Onda, all quite close to each other, but completely, completely different. So it's really a great, uh, a great experience because you can. I like to say that you can travel and uh, see and discover the region just within a glass, you know, staying at home, you can really go all around uh, smelling and tasting the wines. They are almost uh, vinified in the same way. What does it mean? It means that um, all our single vineyards of uh, Barolo and the Barbaresco ones, they do indigenous uh, and sponta they do f spontaneous fermentation with indigenous yeasts yeah. in wooden fermentation vats. Mm -hmm. um, the, the idea is to keep and to use always the same vats for that specific single vineyard because mm -hmm. we like to keep what I like to call the yeast memory. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the vines are, are very old in all of them, all of the three single vineyards and uh, the environment, uh, the wooden environment where the yeasts uh, are fermenting, it, it, it keeps them, mm. the environment, it keeps them alive. So yeah. that's why you are always using the same, <clears throat> the same uh, wooden vats for specific single vineyards. So the fermentation starts spontaneously, spontaneously with the same yeast from that yep. specific vineyard. So yep. it's really a different environment. Um, Villero, Brunate and Vigna Rionda, um, they have completely different soils. Villero usually is the most generous, most open of our single vineyards. It's mm -hmm. the one we pick first and it's the one that's you know, more, more open at the, at the beginning. It's southwest exposed. The soil is rich in clay, but it's a fine clay. There's marl and some um, limestone and not that many um, calcareous deposits. Mm -hmm. So mainly limestone, fine clay and some marl for five meters underground. Mm -hmm. Brunate, we were talking about this before, the La Morra conglomerates, more porous and softer soil. Yeah. But different you say, so it's the most structured of the yes, La Morra groups. Yes, but it's given by, yeah, the, 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 you, you're right, the, the, the texture, it's always different and it's, it's the most... Uh, uh, Serra Lungian uh, Barolo from La Morra yep. because usually the texture is there, yep. it's powerful. This is given also by the elevation because uh, uh, Brunate is such a, it's a long, narrow tongue of land. It starts from the top of La Morra Hill and it ends up in down the hill in Barolo. Yes. We are at the top. 
where La Morra, just close to La Morra, where Brunate starts, so pretty high in elevation. This diurnal excursion of temperature, which is big in, uh, in Brunate, during the summertime it can be more than 20 Celsius degrees between day and mm -hmm. night. I mean, this year it was 40 degrees during the day in July and 18 at night. Yeah. So it's big. This makes the skin of the berries thicker. So we, we can extract uh, more colors, more tendons, yeah. and that's why it's usually more powerful than the other Lamoras. And good uh, for maybe. acid retention as well, with yes. those diurnal differences. And you can see that in the 18, and it's got, it's got lovely acidity in it. Even if we are always uh, very traditional and very classic in our style of, style of vinification, I always like to say that Brunate is the most modern itself because of the color that's deeper. Mm. I like to say it's a wine that reminds how to be young even after a few years in the bottle. In mm. general, Barolo does it, but this wine keeps the youth mm. more than other single vineyards that evolved maybe in the, in the first 10 or 15 years, while Brunate keeps the primary aromas after also 20, more than yep. 20 years. So and it's I, a great vineyard. I think you see that contrast with the Valero. There's these beautiful faded flowers yes. and this savory nature and a very long layered tannin uh, and, and there's, there's a little more attack in the Brunate, albeit two different years. Yes. Um, there's certainly very vibrant red fruit, but structure as well. Yeah. Um, but looking, you know, it's actually still to me looking looking quite quite approachable. You know, 16 Brunate, I, I think uh, for me, that was one that on, on release I needed to keep a half a bottle open for five days before yeah, yeah, yeah. it sort of came together. Uh, That's the vintage. The 16s in general are not, are not ready yet. Yeah. Amazing vintage, beautiful, but mm. it, 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 it takes some time to appreciate the 16s. Yeah. I think you're, I agree with you, you're completely right. Now it's, it's definitely approachable, but again, it's given by the 2018 vintage. The yeah. 2018 vintage is definitely readier than the 16. The 16 yeah. Brunate, I agree with you, is not ready yet. Yeah. In fact, for some single vineyards like Busia, we are producing from Monforte, and Vigna Rionda from Serra Lunga, yeah. Both the 16s will be released as reservas, but they are not yet released yep. because yep. they need time. We do yep. the effort of warehousing with those, yes. uh, yep. with those single vineyards and we release them when they start to be ready. Of course, if you want to keep them 57 years in your cellar, you can do it. <laughs> but uh, you can start appreciating them when they are released. Well, let's talk about Vigna Rionda then. Uh, so the last one in the lineup. 2013 was released in Australia, I'm not sure about Europe, before 2012. Oh yes. 2012 released uh, just, After just, just recently. 11 and 12 together, sorry, 11 and 13 together before the 12, just yeah. to make it more confusing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so tell me, tell me why that was, and, and, and we'll wrap up with a bit of a, a quick talk about Vigna Rionda. Vigna Rionda, it's an amazing site. It's an iconic uh, vineyard from Serra Lunga. It's called Vigna Rionda. Vigna Rionda means round vineyard. It's a natural south exposed and round amphitheater. It's beautiful. It's mm. protected more by hail, has a different microclimate, quite warm because the heat stays there in this little theater no? Uh, and so the heat stays there, the ripening is quite fast um, and you, you should come in May and mm -hmm. see the difference in between the shoots. The shoots in, in uh, Vigna Rionda, they grow super fast, mm -hmm. faster than uh, uh, La Morra and uh, in, in the other parts of the, mm -hmm. of the Barolo area. But then they get stuck in July because it's warm and so yeah. it's a slow ripening slow ripening even if the flowering starts before than other places yes. so it starts okay. first then it stops and then it 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 runs again yeah. Yeah. at the end of uh, september early october and then you get that late season ripening exactly for the beautiful tenants so it's like oh. a really more than six months in between the flowering time mm -hmm. and uh, and the uh, and the picking time so mm -hmm. it's really an iconic uh, iconic vineyard it's also important to say that uh, it's not common to find uh, um, uh, active uh, calcareous deposits in our region and brunate has the highest rate like 12 percent of active mm -hmm. calcareous deposit which is very uncommon it looks like a, a champagne so mm -hmm. you know with this yeah. active uh, so, so you meant vinirionda vinirionda yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, in Vigna yeah. And um, I find also very interesting the fact that, that uh, it's um, the soil of Vigna uh, Rionda, it's um, 
uh, suolo glaciale, we say in Italian. So it comes from a gl glacier. Yep, yep. Uh, in fact, there are in the micro elements of the soil in Vignerionda and the minerals contained in the soil of Vignerionda, lots of elements in common with the Monviso Valley. Monviso mm. is the highest mountain of Piedmont, it's a beautiful mountain on the Alps. Mm. That's like a two hours driving up north and there are so many elements in common this means that uh, the soil of Vignarion and that part of the of, of Serra Lunga and then it goes up till the Alta Langa outside of the Barolo area but not far away it's a very old ancient soil and it's not uh, like La Morra a sea sedimentary soil which is a younger soil and softer this is compact hard there wasn't the sea over there millions of years ago. So it's the, we, the, the, the soft part was moved away by the erosion. We still have the, the bones of the hills, no? Mm -hmm. uh, compact, hard, expressive, and very powerful, yes, but elegant. If you get the patient to wait, it gives you like the, one of the greatest expression of Nebbiolo, pure, def refined, elegant, balanced. Yeah. It's aged longer compared to the other two in the wood, yeah. 30 months, stocking a barrel, and then uh, seven years in the bottle. So mm -hmm. the 2012 is the, is the well, current vintage we are having right now. I've it's got to say, if you can get your hands on a Vigna Rionda, do it. There's a few producers of Vigna Rionda. Odero are making a fantastic one. I love seeing the 2012 now. 2012 is a fantastic year that I think produced very classically styled uh, Barolos. There's an elegance and a sophistication to your 2012 in your Rionda. It's just entering the next phase of development where you're seeing no. more secondary characters come through. Vigna Rionda and Serra Lunga in general, you're seeing less overt fruit characters. You'll see more almost tea-like characters, slaty characters, graphite characters. Darker. In, yeah. in darker, the fruit Mushroom is darker. Fruit. Yeah. yeah, mushroomy. Truffle, truffle. Yeah, truffle, exactly. Yes. Makes you hungry, this yeah. one. Absolutely. Um, but beautiful, beautiful tannins here, beautiful length. It's been an absolute pleasure to drink. I haven't been spitting that at all. Um, it's a stunning, a stunning wine. Pietro and his family have also been involved in uh, a lot with truffles, hazelnuts, honey, some beautiful produce in, uh, in Piedmont. Um, so if you ever make it over there, visit the winery, um, check out what's going on. We're going to have a range of these up and up for grabs for you to try and, and devour. Um, please do the compare and contrast. Grab a couple of different bottles. Try them side by side. Um, refer back to some of P Pietro's comments. It's been wonderful to hear from him. Wonderful to try his Timorasso. Pietro, thank, thank you so you much. Thank you very much. I look forward thank to meeting you. Thank you so much. You. Thank you, really. I look forward to meeting your dog soon. Ah. <laughs> I'll, I'll introduce you to her. She's, yeah. she's actually the boss. What's her name? She's Fianna. Fiamma. Fiamma. What's that mean? Flame. Flame. Ah. Oh, okay. Because she's always on fire. Hey. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. We'll see you next Pleasure. time, guys. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you.